It's really going to throw a wrench in their plan when one day this earth's still moving through space, still spinning around on its axis, and God shuts the wind off. John says that he saw it. Wind has a very profound impact on your everyday life, whether you realize it or not. Without wind, you don't get any tides in the, or I'm sorry, currents in the ocean. You still have tides, but there's no current. If you don't have current in the ocean, it means that everything's dead water. Okay, you have heard our pastor preach on his old canoeing days. Dead water was the hardest thing to row through. You didn't have any help from the water to move you. Right? Well, imagine if all the water all around the world was dead water. Keep in mind, we've already had six seals open. The earth don't look the way that it used to. Right? Getting food isn't as easy as it used to be. Getting water, it may not come out of a tap anymore. You may have to go down to the river to get it. Well, what if all the water stopped flowing? What if it was at a standstill? What if all the water, they tell, the Great Lakes, they tell me are the largest body of freshwater lakes in the entire world. In fact, I can't remember the percentage. I want to say it's something like 30 or 40 percent of all the world's fresh waters found in them lakes. Well, what if the water stopped moving? Because the wind shut off. Can't use water any longer to use hydroelectric dams, provide energy. Not to mention shipping's a whole lot harder if you don't have the current working with you as opposed to against you. And we've already had a third of what we would call the food supply gone. We've already said measure of wheat, measure or measure of wheat, or three measures of barley costs you a whole day's wages. I'm sure that at some point, what? Why did he stop the wind? Well, it's not just because of the water. Wind's what brings you your lovely weather cycle. Brother Jordan, why is it warmer this week than it was last week? Because God caused the wind to blow in a different direction and brought heat in instead of cold. Right? One of the things about us living it, we can get weather from Canada, we can get weather from the Atlantic Ocean, we can get weather from the Gulf, we can get it from out west. Just depends on which way the wind's blowing. But imagine no wind. No breath of fresh air wherever you are because all the air is stagnant. There's no way that you can go to feel the wind cool the sweat on your brow. Nowhere that you can go that the wind's going to be able to bring a pleasant scent to your nose. No, you're stuck where you're at. Mankind's already run to the hills to hide in the rocks in those caves. But can you imagine living in a cave where there's no air circulating? What you'd be stuck with is all the smells in the cave. It's not going to be a pleasant time. You know what causes clouds to move in the sky? Wind. When the sixth seal was opened up, it says that he rolled heaven back as a scroll. That's why they ran to the mountains and the hills, so that they wouldn't have to come face to face with God. But there's not even a hope, a whisper, a chance that a cloud's going to come in and block out the thing that they don't want to see. Give them just a little bit, tiny bit of reprieve where they wouldn't have been in the presence of an almighty God. They got no hope of that happening. Why? Because the wind got shut off. It says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having a seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. This here is the Apostle John seeing it actually happened, those 144,000 that were prophesied that would make it through the great tribulation that are Israelites. Here, they're being numbered. 
And he says, verse number 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed. They were sealed in 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. It says the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. The tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. The tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Asher, 12,000. Right? Nephilim were sealed 12,000. Manasses were sealed 12,000. Simeon were sealed 12,000. Levi were sealed 12,000. Then Issachar were sealed 12,000. And Zabulon were sealed 12,000. And the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Benjamin were sealed 12,000. What's that add up to? 144,000. He says, And this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and palms in their hand. Talking about palm leaves. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne with, uh, on their faces and worshiped God saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever amen one of the elders answered saying unto me well keep in mind John hadn't asked a question but yet the elder knew the question he was asking well, who were one of the elders? Well, we know the elders were the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles. Wouldn't it be just like God for John to look over at John and say, Oh, yeah, I remember asking what's going on right here. Let me just tell you. You don't even have to ask. Right? But, says one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now keep in mind, this first 144,000 that came out of the tribes of Israel, then we've got a number that comes, he says, out of all nations, all peoples. No cap on how many there can be. In fact, he says it's a number that no man can number. We can count pretty high. But John says you can't count the group that's coming out in this passage as they come of all nations all kindreds it's one thing to say there's going to be somebody there from all nations well America's a pretty big place kindred means every different type of person out of that country or out of that nation for instance it says he goes down and he numbers all 12 tribes of Israel well they were all Hebrew they were all Israelites. They were all a part of the same nation, but they all didn't come from the same family. They had 12 divisions of different families within Israel. Well, how many different divisions of families do you think are in America or in England or in Africa? Or, I mean, people have been fighting over lines in the dirt as long as people have been around. Why? Because my kindred's different than your kindred. Right? Hatfield and McCoys. Right? What's that? Well, they weren't the same kindred, but they came from the same place. They shared property. Well, at least a property line. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? He's not just saying they're coming out of all nations. He's saying you get into those nations, he's saying all kindred. Doesn't matter where you came from. This side of the tracks or the other side of the tracks. Doesn't matter if you grew up with change in your pocket or if you were born into a life of luxury. He says they all had to go through the same thing to get to where they were on that day. We'll get to that here in a second. He says, not just of all kindred, all people. I'll give you a good example. My mom and dad have three kids. None of us are the same. That one's weird. He's goofy. But I heard about some of the things that he did when they went to the Festival of Lights, and although I find it very funny, my mother did not find it so entertaining. 
Okay, then we got Sydney. She's weird too. She don't make sense to me either. And I'm the weirdest. <laughs> right? We're all part of one kindred, but we kind of different people. Right? The world's got laborers. The world's got thinkers. The world has people that are mechanically minded. There are people that are intellectually minded. There are people that are teachers. There are people that are helpers. As the Bible would call them, they would go and they'd be supporters of they'd meet the needs they'd bear one another's burdens they were servants right not in the sense that they were slaves and that's why they served but they chose to serve because that's what God had given them the gift to do they're all part of the same family but there's different kind of people in the world you got sociable people right you got introverts believe it or not brother Jordan's actually kind of introverted I can get up and talk and talk all day long if that's what God wanted me to do I get up and preach until I pass out but I need to go recharge after right this is the way God wired me it wears me out being around people right there are other people that they get energy from hanging around other people right they go to a group of people that they've never met before it's like you know they just got plugged into a direct line of caffeine right they're just wired ready to go Right, but he says, out of all different kind of people. He says, you won't be able to say on that day that God didn't let this kind of person get into or come out of great tribulation. It says in tongues. How many different places can you go nowadays? Even if they claim to speak English, you can't understand them. Y'all ever heard of Louisiana? They don't speak English down there. But every now and then I'll get a call at work and I'm like, dude, where are you from? And tell me so I'd never show up. You all, you all sound weird. Right? Literally, it's talking about different languages, but it's talking about dialects. It's talking about people that come from maybe the same place, but they sound different. Why? Because they came from different backgrounds. The verse is literally saying that God discrimi discriminates against no one God predetermined that no one would go to hell it's God's will that none should perish he made no restriction that because you were born here you did this you did that you must die and go to hell no it came out of all nations all people all languages doesn't matter where you came from there's a way that even in great tribulation God made a way for you to find favor in the eyes of God. It's different than our dispensation. We live in the dispensation of grace. What's that mean? For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. That is for the present day and the present hour. Once the great tribulation happens, that will not be the way that one can find salvation during the great tribulation. In order for someone to be redeemed out of the great tribulation, we find in these verses what must be done. It says, verse number 15, referring to that number that cannot be numbered, that were arrayed in white robes that had palm leaves in their hands that God wiped away the very tears from their eyes okay it says therefore are, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them they have a place reserved for them in heaven it says for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. And God shall, hasn't yet, but shall, wipe away all tears from their eyes. You know how these people made it into heaven? They starved. Does not this verse say that the lamb shall feed them? Why? Because the world did not feed them. They put their faith... In God rather than the Antichrist the world as we saw talking about the seals of the seals that had already been opened when one was open great utterings came out 
of those that were slain for the name of the Lamb in the great tribulation. These are them. They said, How long, Lord, wilt thou not avenge us for what they did to us? What'd they do? They starved them. They cut off food from them. We haven't got there yet, but in the end times, you must receive the mark of the beast either in your right hand or in your forehead. It's a lot easier nowadays with RFID chips. I don't think that people are, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be some people demon-possessed that are walking around. I mean, look at the people that got face tattoos now. There's going to be some of them doing that in the Great Tribulation. But also to make it more palatable, just like the COVID vaccine, I'll try not to get political. Right? Oh, no, you won't even be able to see it. You don't even need a chip in your hand anymore. Amazon, you put your hand out in front of it and it scans your palm print. No, thank you. Right? I don't even like the vending machine at work using my thumbprint for me to pay with it. That's weird. Right? But you won't be able to do anything without that mark, either in your forehead or in your right hand. I'm not talking about just going and buying stuff. You won't be able to leave your home without the mark. They're going to come and take you out of your home and give it to somebody else who had the mark because you're not one of the chosen. You're not a part of the in crowd. Where are they going to send them to? For lack of a better term, they're going to send them to concentration camps and they're going to round them up. And they're going to starve them and they're going to torture them and they're going to put them to the, the breaking wheel until they recant Christ and embrace the Antichrist. They'll have been starved. They'll have been slaughtered. Look. It says, And shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. Because they were starved, because they were slaughtered, they separated themselves from the Antichrist. Christ steps in and makes a way for them to become saints. They paid the price of their faith with their own blood, but their blood did not save them. Still took the lamb to give them everlasting life. Because of their commitment to the name of Christ, He leads them to fountains of living water. Didn't Jesus say that if any man drink of the water I give him, it should be a fountain, well of water springing up within him, living water? What did you have to do to get a drink of that water? Well, on the day that you got saved, all you had to do was believe. Right? You had to confess, repent, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Right? Romans 10 tells us, with the mouth, confession is made unto righteousness, with the heart, man believeth unto salvation. What did you do? You asked Jesus to save you, and he did. He gave you a drink of water. Just like that woman at the well she left her water pot you weren't looking for a drink after that day you got the drink up front they have to suffer and go without and starve and I wonder how many times they're going to feel like that rich man in the story of Lazarus and the rich man that died and went to hell he said he just wanted one drop of water to cool his tongue in that flame because he was tormented in the flame well they're not going to be tormented spiritually although without the presence of the Holy Ghost here who knows what demons and everything else are going to do to people but they're literally going to suffer for the hope of a drink that they will be rewarded your faith was accepting a gift their faith they have to accept the fire in order to walk through the fire and receive a drink of living water. That right there ought to give you enough conviction to go out and try and win people to the Lord now. Because yes, people can get saved out of the great tribulation. And yes, they'll be counted among the masses in white robes. And that palm leaf is a picture of what? Peace. Christ gave them a white robe. Right? He cleansed them in His blood because they shed their blood and would not submit to a wicked Antichrist. And he gives them a palm leaf. Y'all remember when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they thought that he was going to be setting up his 
earthly kingdom. They were crying, Hosanna. They laid palm leaves out in front of them. Why? The king's coming. There will be peace. I mean, it only was prophesied by Isaiah that he would be the prince of peace. Why do you think they came with palm leaves? Because they said, we don't want Rome. We don't want the conflict. We want peace. Well, these people that come through the great church, that gave their lives because they believed God rather than believe in the Antichrist. They get peace, but not on this earth. Their peace came through death. It says he shall lead them under fountains of living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There's nobody making it out of the great tribulation. Even though they will be saved. There's nobody who gets saved out of the great tribulation and comes out of it looking like rainbow all stone faced. These people will be broken physically, emotionally, spiritually by the time they get to where they're presented with white robes. It'll take the very hand of God to undo to them what the hand of man did during the great tribulation. God's going to have to wipe away the tears from their eyes, otherwise they would never stop crying. I wonder. I know that when the church is raptured out, the Bible says that strong delusion will be sent from God to where the world won't remember the church. But nowhere does it say that the people coming out of the great tribulation won't remember the family members that they left on this side. I wonder how many times, I mean, look at the American Civil War. You had brother fighting against brother. You had family against family. Look at how heated things get now in so-called peaceful times where you've got neighbors trying to kill neighbors. These people coming out of the Great Tribulation, I'm sure that they did all they could to tell other people. What if the people they cared about the most were the ones that put them to the sword or to the executioner's stand or pulled that handle which delivered death to them? Some of the most, quote-unquote, humane ways that nowadays they execute people for crimes, that'll be considered humane compared to what they're, they're going to be torn asunder, ripped to shreds. They're not going to spill a little blood. They're going to give their life's blood. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? It's no wonder that these are the ones that God elects, chooses to serve in His temple. They gave everything for Him. They ought to be, even though it hadn't happened yet, inspiration for you. God rewards their faithfulness. Because without faith, it's impossible to please them. There will still be faith in the Great Tribulation. And that faith will be transformed into fellowship with God eventually. On the other side. But they'll have to pay the ultimate price. You ought to crawl into the altar today thanking God that you don't have to do that in order to receive salvation. Yes, those people will have had to have never heard the gospel before and rejected anything having to do with church because if they had heard the gospel it says their conscience will be seared with a hot iron right to where they will believe a lie they'll accept the mark of the beast these are going to be people that never had a chance before but yet they'll have to give so much of themselves what do you have to do you had to humble yourself what do these people have to do they literally have to be willing to be hacked and to be torn and to be scattered abroad to live as wild animals out in the wilderness away from society until what? Knowing that one day they're going to get caught. Knowing that even though there may be somebody that's helping them, one day somebody's going to say something or somebody's going to step on the wrong thing or somebody's going to let something slip and then what? 
then it's all over. For lack of a better term, the Gestapo's coming. And they won't stop. When will they stop, Brother Jordan, when they catch all of them? When's that? I assume it's a little bit before chapter number 7 of Revelation. Because in chapter number 6, he told them when that seal was opened, he said, not yet. There's still some. Who is he talking about? He says, there's still 144,000 of my chosen people down there. And in chapter 7, they are marked. They are numbered as one of God's chosen people. And then what happens? God takes those that came out of the great tribulation, gives them those white robes and those palm leaves. Why? Because he's gearing up to come back into laying on the Mount of Olives and split it in half. Why? For his 144,000 that are still there. But in chapter number 8, we're probably not going to get so deep into chapter number 8 today. But the first verse of chapter number 8 has always struck me. It says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, all everything that we just happened, that was all under sixth seal. Now we're on to number seven. It's the last seal that was on that book. It says, When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Y'all realize that since the dawn of time, whenever God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When heaven get made in the beginning? When the earth get made in the beginning? When was that? I don't know. God made it. And it was there for a while before he ever did anything with the earth. Where was everything at? It was all taking place in heaven. We read in this book of Revelation, the seraphim that fly around us. Two wings that cover the face, two wings that cover the feet, the other two they fly. What do they sing all day long? Holy, holy, holy. We know that Lucifer, before he betrayed God and was cast out of heaven, that he was an angel full of instruments. He was made to constantly play songs of worship to God. We know that the saints already have been crying and worshiping and the elders and the four beasts. Heaven's not a quiet place. In fact, this world, we've heard it said many a times, is the quietest world you're ever going to live in. Hell's full of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. But heaven is full of great jubilation and shouting and worship. Music. We've already read where they'll sing a new song that no one's sung before. But for half an hour when that seventh seal is open, it goes dead quiet in heaven. The sky's already been rolled back as a scroll. If they can see what's happening in heaven, I wonder if they can hear what's happening in heaven from the earth. You say, is there a chapter and verse on this, Brother Jordan? No. These are just things that Brother Jordan thinks about when he's alone with God. If they can look up and they can see the face of God, I wonder if they can hear the praise that's being devoted to the Almighty God. Where are you going with this, Brother Jordan? You know what the scariest sound in the world is? Silence. If you're out in the middle of the woods and the birds stop singing at night and the crickets stop cricket at night and all the bugs all of a sudden seem to have disappeared that means something that they're terrified of showed up on the scene you ever been home at night and something just sounds a little bit different the AC didn't kick on and make the same noise that it normally does sounded a little bit different sound can terrify you was that the sound of the door lock opening? Everybody's inside that's supposed to be inside. Sound can play a lot of tricks on you. Well, imagine a place that has always been full of praise and worship. Something's happened that's never happened before and is never going to happen again. The last seal on this book was removed. That means the book's been opened. 
It's no longer locked. And when that seal comes off of this book, it goes quiet. Not for long. It says about the space of half an hour. Now that was as the Apostle John perceived it. I don't know how long it's going to be quiet. But John says, it was about half an hour. It wasn't short, but it wasn't long. So it's not like you could hear a pin drop and then everybody went back to doing what they were doing. He says, no, people took time to be silent. Not quiet. Quiet is where you just make your voice lower so you're not disturbing anybody. So it says, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour dead silent you know one of the things that our elite military forces do when they're training one of those soldiers as it's called sensory deprivation they say that if you aren't properly trained to handle it it can be the worst form of torture in the world. Because your brain is fearfully and wonderfully made. God did something when he made your brain. Your brain knows that you need input in order to function. Right? God was made to, or man was made by God to what? Fellowship with God. When man sinned, what did man do? He busied himself with things to keep him occupied so he wouldn't remember that he once had fellowship with God. If there's silence in heaven for about half an hour, and if the earth can hear what's going on in heaven, where's all the people that are left at right now? They're hiding in dark caves deep in the mountains. They've got no light. They've got no wind. They can't feel a breeze come across them. We've already seen that. They've got no sight. They've got no sense of touch. They just ran into the middle of nowhere. I'm sure that there's nothing for them to taste. What are they? They are locked away from everything because they fear coming before the face of an almighty God. In fact, they're crying to the rocks and the mountains that they would fall on them. And ever since, God's rolled the sky back. They've heard this great praising and shouting, and it used to make them angry because they said, oh, they're talking about that Jesus again. And then out of nowhere, nothing. Silent. And they're locked in a deep, dark pit with no food, no air, now no sound they know God's fixing to do something and for the space of half an hour it's going to be torturous to them what's he planning we can't go out like this we can't be the chickens that are in the cave hiding ourselves away but it says that the kings and the great men run to the mountains they said, if anybody's left out there, they're going to call us cowards. What happened? God gets them real alone and real lonely. And their conscience is going to start driving them mad. They say if you lock somebody in a soundproof room, they'll still hear things. Are they insane? No. But your brain knows that there should be sound, so it makes up sounds for you to hear. You lock somebody in a dark room long enough, they'll start seeing shapes when there are no shapes. You put somebody in water long enough, they're going to feel something brush up against their leg when the tank's empty. That is your brain trying to keep itself active so it doesn't shut off. What are you saying? You do that? It says for about the space of half an hour. I wonder how many people in today's society where everything is overstimulated, everything is always got to go, got to do, got to... I wonder how many people in our day would go insane from five minutes. But 30 minutes seems like an infinity when you're left with nothing. 
but you and your thoughts. It says God shut it off. Silence. Nothing. Coming out of heaven. When God gets quiet, usually other things get quiet too. Why? Because it's not normal. Then it says, And I saw seven angels which were stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. There was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came up, which came with prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. God makes it quiet. And you remember in our last chapter, well not too many, chapter number six, when those saints were crying, the martyred, how long, Lord, until we're avenged? God says, not yet. Well, every time they prayed one of those prayers, every time that somebody in our dispensation prayed a prayer that God would take care of the wicked and the unjust men of the world, that God would come and, as the Apostle John said at the end of this, cha the end of this book, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Lord, you, you promised you were coming. I pray that you come today. Every single one of those prayers, what God do? He preserved them. He bottled them. But you've heard our pastor teach and preach that God has three answers, yes, no, and not now. And God the Father, knowing when the time would be, took all of those prayers and said, it's so precious to me. I'm going to set them aside for one day. What happened on that day? Well, an angel was given a golden censer. That's what they used to start the fires. And much incense was given. Why? Because those prayers, those sweet to God, they were prayed through bitter tears. They were prayed through heartbreak. They were prayed in brokenness. And God gives much incense because why? Their desire to be with God, to be united with the one that is altogether lovely. That was the focal point of their affection. That they fixed their face towards Jesus and they pursued after him. And their deepest desire was what? To be united with him. That he would come back. He takes, he knows that'd be a bitter sense, so what's he do? He gives much good incense. And he lights them up before not just any altar. This is the altar that if you go and study the Old Testament, the altar for the burnt sacrifices, that was just a picture of what God gave to them on what the real one looks like in heaven. And God said all of those sacrifices, all of those prayers, all of those desires and petitions and brokenheartedness where you wanted God to come back, he says, it's time to offer up those sacrifices unto God. And he says, but it is not a sad thing. Burn it with much incense. Why? Because today is a sweet day. There's a day that God will do what he promised to do. And all those prayers will be answered. Then it says in the prayers of all the saints, not just those that came out of the great tribulation, all the saints. From Adam all the way up to the last one to get in from the great tribulation. All those that have prayed, Lord, come quickly. Lord, today would be a great day for your return. On that day, you'll see your own prayer be offered up to God as a burnt sacrifice, as a sweet-smelling savor unto our Heavenly Father. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers. The prayers had no smoke. Why? Because your prayers to God... If they make it to God, they don't have self in them. You can talk all you want to, your words aren't going to get higher than the ceiling. Can't regard iniquity in your heart or God won't hear your prayers. These are the prayers that God preserved. Why? Because they were precious to Him. 
There is no smoke out of that. Why? Because they were pure. Just like that gold, silver, and precious gems, there's nothing to burn away. There's no impurities in them, but yet they're put on the altar before God. The incense is what adds the smoke. That's what is being burned away. Does the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand? What was that angel's job? He knew that one day he was going to take those prayers that God had set aside. He was going to offer them up to God. And God would say, it's time. This is the day that the events start in motion where Jesus comes back to earth for the second time. And you know what it starts with? It starts with silence. It starts with some incense. A sacrifice of the prayers of the saints. And here the smoke comes up before God. What is it? That's the proof that, Lord, they've all been offered. The only thing left is the smoke from the incense. But what's he do? He takes some coals off of that fire. And God uses the very prayers of the saints. And what was left over from the incense that was burned to offer them up unto him. That angel takes a handful of it. What's he do? He threw it down to the earth. What happens? The world gets messed up. Can you imagine being for a space of half an hour? Nothing. You've about gone mad, tucked away in a cave somewhere, hiding from God, because you know you're not worthy to stand before Him. And your mind playing tricks on you, and the very next thing you hear, like a crash, literally, that came out of heaven, it says, and there were voices. Well, it's easy to think that the voices after that fire from the altar was cast down to heaven or cast down to earth from heaven. What are them voices? I don't know. But they're going to hear them, and it's going to scare them to high heaven. Thunderings. They haven't seen a storm since the wind stopped. Clouds haven't moved. There's been no rainfall. Why? Because there's been no clouds. Those four angels held the winds. And now out of nowhere they hear thunderings. That's something that they weren't expecting. It says, and lightning. But and an earthquake. What is it? It's one earthquake that's going to shake the whole world at once. They talk about the big one out there in St. Andreas Fault. No, that's the big one. Doesn't matter where you're hiding in the very rocks of the earth, in tunnels. It's going to feel like God puts you inside of a blender. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? He's giving them the wake up call. He just showed them how much power he's had. He shut the wind off, he rolled the sky back like it was a scroll. Everything that he promised he would do, he's doing it. Then he shuts everything off, silence. Then how's he say, all right, boys, if you want to meet him, if you want to go to war against Christ, you're welcome to. It's game time. Ring the bell. Throw the fire down from heaven. Let's get it started. And what's he do? He just shakes them in his hand. Just reveals a little bit of his power. Then, next week, Lord willing, we're going to start hitting on these seven angels that seven trumpets were given to. You know what trumpets do? Trumpets signal something. You know what they used to call the trumpet players in the courts of kings? They used to call them heralds. Because when they sounded, it heralded something had just happened. Worthy of taking note of it. Well, when Christ comes back, guess how many trumpeters he gets? Seven. Why? Because he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But next week we'll look at what each time they trumpet, they sound off. Signaling that Christ is coming back. Things start lining up 
for his second coming. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.